Tassa Namo Tassa Bagoato Arahato Summa Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bagoato Arahato Summa Sambudasa Udangdamang Sangang Namasami So um, actually, I'm not planning on giving a Dhamma talk today. It's just we get so little music in the Theravada that it's nice to have Rahul say that invitation. Um, I wanted Ajahn Kovilo to have at least one chance for a community story session, which is where we have different people come up and actually talk about um, their path to the Dhamma and specifically what brought you to the Dhamma and what it's meant to you. Um, and, um, but just before we do transition over, um, I did feel at least it was worth speaking to uh, a few conversations that I had with some people close to, um, us recently around, well, suffering and different ways it's coming up from, um, a backyard being torn up by a septic system to uh, so one person deciding whether or not to leave her husband to just, gosh, all sorts of stuff, you know, from the large to the small. And um, it struck me, we spoke a while ago, Ajahn Kobilo and I have begun to realize that uh, books on marriage advice are quite useful for us, actually. So we've <laughs> there's a... There's one, there's one good one we found called uh, The Five Love Languages. Who here has read that? It's pretty common, isn't it? Um, so it maps perfectly onto a Buddhist list called the Sanghavatu, uh, except for physical, um, uh, like acts of physical love. That's not as common. Um, so, but things such as generosity, kind words, consistency, quality time, um, and help. These are all directly in the suttas and in one specific sutta in the numerical discourses. But one thing that struck me is that um, we each have our particular loss language, our language of loss. And so often uh, we had a conversation this morning about, you know, you come back from retreat or some deep experience or a good meditation. Whenever I have a good meditation, I I'm always... Uh, I always know the next day is just going to be just terrible. <laughs> it's like, oh no, it's coming. Um, because so often you come out of that brightness and uh, you just want to ride that fourth noble truth all the way, one continuous inhale. And the first noble truth just doesn't have that. And you do, suffering re-enters. And so often, so much of our fracturing and disease is from not really venerating that first noble truth. Like the Buddha put it there for a reason. We have no problem uh, rejoicing and resting in the bright parts of our lives. What's hard is for us to turn again to the grieving and the difficulty that comes up. And so I think there's something very powerful for, you know, seeing those old patterns that arise again and again. Um, you know, maybe it's feeling uh, not listened to or left out, and you can just dismiss them as some uh, particular neuroses of your own. Or you can understand that this is how you understand death. This is your loss language. And so often I find that, you know, when you're, say, feeling FOMO or something, you know, um, fear of missing out, what really helps is to turn towards it and say, this is, this is death. Like you're watching something die in you. And to really take seriously that so much of our insight into birth, death, suffering, it comes through these mundane experiences day to day. And to really turn towards that and honor it. Um, and I think the languages of loss uh, map quite well onto the languages of love, you know, is, uh, is what, makes you feel secure is a consistency. And so can you see when it's the sense of things being inconsistent and unstable that really uh, continually 
uh, hooks you and hurts? Is it, uh, you know, is your love language something like giving? And is there this sense of scarcity and always wanting to make sure you're shoring up those resources you do have? Is that the continual thread towards the first noble truth for you? Is that your lost language? Um, kind words, is it feeling, you know, is your love language wanting to receive that? And so is your lost language uh, just that deep fear of not being cared for, not being loved in that way of distance? So it doesn't match perfectly, but I thought that was a powerful thing. And I find so often um, just coming back to the Four Noble Truths, and specifically the first is it's just a categorical teaching and it always, always is useful. But I think uh, it would be best to turn it over to others here. Um, so generally what happens is if uh, Ajahn Kobe and I will like scoot over and if people feel they have the interest and heart to come up and say maybe six minutes worth or a bit longer if you feel the need on your path to Dhamma and what it's meant to you. Understand that it's not a self-aggrandizing thing. Um, it's a genuine gift and an honor for others to hear these paths and it's deeply meaningful. So if you're willing to kind of go out on a limb, embarrass yourself a little bit, uh, it's a safe space for that. Yeah, sure. Um... So I think a lot of people, uh, my path to Dhamma started with um, a long period of uh, sadness and anxiety during COVID, during the beginning of COVID specifically, um, you know, when I was just isolated from a lot of people um, doing school online and, um, you know, just suffering the effects of that, like so many of us were, is a really difficult time. And I didn't really have any sources for um, dealing with that effectively. I mean, I've done a little bit of therapy in my past um, to help cope with um, anxiety and depression, but that didn't, that hasn't really cut it. Um, it doesn't really, uh, I guess, treat the causes as effectively as I wanted. And um, I'd, start, I'd had a little brief introduction to meditation before COVID started. I was meditating with uh, Sam Harris's Waking Up app, um, but just very infrequently, like doing one session every few weeks maybe, or once a, once a month, um, but I was interested. And I had a professor while I was doing school online on Zoom, um, a really, really amazing person. And already before I was introduced to Dhamma, just very inspirational as a musician. Um, and he just sort of carried himself with this, I don't know, this clarity, kindness. I just always felt very, listened to comfortable and comfortable in his presence and inspired and also happy so happy and in every single class you know i would leave just with a big smile on my face and i was really really intrigued by this this guy um a professor fogel song <laughs> and um i don't know if i was supposed to use his name oops but if you ever see this, thank you. Um, and I was just like, what, what's your deal? Why are, you, why are you so happy? What's your secret? I've literally never met a person like you in my life. And he told me about Dhamma, about how he's a serious meditation pract practitioner and just about his way of living life. And yeah, that was really a revelation for me that started me down the path of practicing meditation more seriously, just changing the way I live my life on a daily basis. And yeah, I just continued to try to meditate um, and start to be more interested in Buddhism, meet with some different sanghas in San Francisco. And yeah, and it's just totally, totally changed my life. 
in a really deep way. I mean, it's changed my perception of how the whole world works and of, you know, who I am. And yeah, I mean, it's just been incredible, an incredibly beautiful journey for me so far. It's really become my whole life. It's the most important thing to me is following this path. Um, yeah, all the people I've got to meet to inspire me. And yeah, just so, so appreciative. I've, I've, I've really healed a lot since uh, I first came across it. And I'm really grateful and grateful to be here too, because this is an amazing development also being able to have a Sangha in person finally and meet with the monks. It's, it's beautiful. So yeah, thanks. Hi. I think what brought me to Dharma was uh, suffering. Um, it's probably something like 18 years ago. Uh, my marriage was falling apart and my life felt totally like not right. And I was intensely interested in how to find a different way. And my um, best friend at the time, her husband was going to like a Mahayana group in Ballard and had, pre, you know, told me for, I don't know, it was a year or something like, you should come, you should come, you should come. Like, mm, not really interested in religion or whatever. I just had my own idea of what that meant. And then, you know, the rug got pulled on, on for me and I was like, did you mention something about suffering? <laughs> like, is there a way out? And, uh, uh, yeah, so I went to um, the Kadampa group and just was really, um, I really enjoyed the, the humor and the practical, like when you first hear Dharma, you're like, oh my gosh, it seems so obvious. How come I didn't already know this? And it's like almost like hilarious. And you're like, wow, I missed everything. How did I even navigate? Um, and then of course I you know, forget that all the time still, um, but really got, uh, really hooked on um, trying to see clearly in a variety of ways um, and uh, ended up being interested in the insight meditation groups and listened online as I was young kids and really enjoyed uh, time in the evenings just listening to online Dharma talks and then I realized there was an insight meditation in Seattle and joined that. Um, also, just incredibly, incredibly grateful for that. Those teachings just so, I don't know how you guys, re you repeat the same lessons in creative ways and we still don't get it. And I feel like, how, how patient are these teachers to just keep doing that? I still feel incredibly grateful for the, uh, what's, what's obviously just the, the real desire to spread the Dharma and, no matter how dense the students are, myself being the main, anyway. So um, the teachings uh, have opened up a, like I, I live, like all of us, you know, Seattleites, we live a busy life and have a lot of activities, but to have a whole nother way of understanding what the world is and what experiences, what the opportunities are to, fundamentally experience the world in a richer real way where I'm not confused and living in my imagination all the time is just immeasurably like there's no way I would have figured that out there's no way somebody would have you know, had to come and teach me and teach me so the, the I'm grateful for the teachings and grateful that there is this other way of a deeper reality that really appreciate the weekly ability to meet with the group and um, it's it is I mean I've gone through many crises and fundamentally it's just wonderful to know there's this ground level of sanity and beauty no matter how um, wild things get in my mind that is more important than uh, shame and blame and the all the success and failure thank you so much Okay. 
Um, yeah, I definitely have a love-hate relationship, public speaking. Um, and I think that I arrived at the Dharma kind of unknowingly when I was just as a kid, always searching for something um, and would always be reading books about different religions and spiritual paths. And uh, I was raised a Wiccan. Um, so I've always kind of had, I've always had this sense of wonder as far as what I I guess just like having a spiritual practice that um, I was searching for, and um, I still <clears throat> still had a sense of um, I guess emptiness throughout my whole life, and didn't really know um, how to fix that. So, and I still I feel like do that today. Um, because that manifest manifested for me as a essentially when I was a teenager as an as drug addiction essentially and that was a, a large part of my life where I became homeless here in Seattle as a teen um, and got involved with that and um, still try to do a bunch of meditation. Um, trying to grasp at straws to find something, some sort of relief. But um, eventually it was, the decision was made for me when I woke up in Harborview after being in a coma for a month. And um, that's why I sit like this. I can't sit cross-legged because I had the uh, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, which my whole right leg is all skin grafts. So it kind of shot me into um, a place of willingness to do whatever I needed to, to stay, um, have some sort of like equilibrium in my life. And meditation has brought that for me today. And I'm not obviously very perfect at doing it every day, but um, I can say that I actually do meditate on a daily basis, which is what something I really wanted to do pretty much my whole life. and. Um, I'm really happy that a friend brought me here because uh, I imagine in the most millennial way possible, I, I was searched for whatever, what the best Buddhist path was for me. I did a top 10 list on the internet and it said, <clears throat> said Thai forest tradition and Zen. So those are the, those are the two ones that I do now. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I do. I'm very happy to hopefully come here more regularly. And like the what I said last time was I go to the Zen temple up on Beacon Hill. And ironically, some of the people up there, um, even a couple of the monks are also in recovery. So um, it's been very helpful for me. And I also do a Buddhist based recovery group that's similar to 12 steps, but um, with the Buddhist and meditation and Theravada tradition. So yeah, that's where my path has gone. Some people have a midlife crisis. I kind of ended up having an early life crisis. So I was born with ADHD, which made school a lot of fun. And then when I was five, I woke up in the middle of the night throwing up neon green, which, as you can imagine, my parents really enjoyed. That freaked my mom out quite a bit. And I made a return performance two years later when I got E. coli and ended up in the hospital. And another six years later, when a desk lamp that had been given to me by my parents on my birthday, no less, blew up in my face, which isn't why I wear glasses. I've worn these since I was like six months old. So in high school, I started thinking about all this in addition to all the craziness that goes on in the world and thought, you know, someone or something must want me here because I should be dead at least three times over. That neon green throw up 
my appendix burst slightly more than a week previously. During that week, I'd gone to my pediatrician and he hadn't found it. The E. coli, when I was in the hospital, I was in the same room with a kid whose mom had, I'm blanking on the word, but it's that, it's that psychiatric disorder where you make someone else sick, Munchausen by proxy. So, and anyway, so I started looking around for answers and my best friend who I'd met when we were in preschool together and, and we'd met literally as a result of fighting over a Tonka truck. I'm not even kidding. And I ended up being the best man at his wedding and the godfather to his firstborn son. So <laughs> apparently fighting over a toy is a great way to meet a, meet a lifelong friend. Anyway, tangents, tangents, all his tangents. He seemed to be in a really good place in high school. There'd been some struggles, but well, what else is new? And I asked him, hey, you seem to have things together or in a way that I don't, what's going on? And he said that he'd been studying Buddhism and meditating. And I ended up borrowing a book called Teachings of Buddha by Bokyo Dendo Kyokai from another family friend reading it, thinking, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And this isn't Christianity where they conveniently make up the problem and give you the solution. This is something that, well, basically everybody suffers in some way. It's an acknowledgement of an actual thing and a offer of a solution. So I started reading everything I could about it, started meditating, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, there's stuff that happened between then and now, but that's a whole long story that can be summed up as basically I read a whole lot of popular Dharma books, which were interesting, but not really that enlightening after college. I got really interested in actually going back to studying the sutras and finding monks to learn from and eventually found Magaseka. Magaseka and Reed led me to Clear Mountain. And after being aware of the community for, oh, I think I probably heard about y'all a month and a half to two months before I showed up here the first time, which was last week. So that's sort of mean Dharma and Dharma has really just been a stabilizing, focusing influence in my life. It's given things purpose in a way that helps a lot with the ADHD and depression and the anxiety and everything else. I just took a public speaking course, so I have no excuses. <laughs> Hopefully my professor is watching. Probably not, but so I've always had a very strained relationship with things. And what I mean by that is I get really obsessed with stuff and then suddenly stop liking them. Um, fortunately, not that way with people, but I am definitely that way with subjects of interest. When I was really little, I wanted to be an Egyptologist. I was super obsessed with it. I had all these books. I would talk everybody's ear off about it. And one day I remember I was talking my brother's ear off about it. And I remember the exact thought just coming into my head. Hmm, I'm not interested in this anymore. And it hasn't necessarily been that extreme with everything that I've had interest in throughout my life, but it's been quite similar. Things like rock climbing, mountaineering, chess, um, 
so many different things I've had that sort of relationship with. And I've found that the intermittent thing that I'll always come back to kind of when I snap out of an obsession is the Dhamma. Um, I first heard about it my freshman year of high school in a Catholic school, actually. I remember always thinking that the priests had a really cool um, quality to them, something that I thought might be up my alley, but I was like, I'm not really sure I want to give up marriage and having a family. But then one of my high school um, history teachers showed us a video about the Buddha's life. And I was like, hmm, maybe I don't want a family and <laughs> to get married. I was like, this, this seems a little bit better. Um, but through, through these um, subsequent obsessions and um, falling out of them, the Dhamma is something where I've kind of come back to it and on the one hand wished I could kind of fall into that sort of obsessiveness with it, but it's always seemed to be something that requires a lot more work than these other obsessions. It's something I have to kind of roll up my sleeves and um, put in some serious dedication to it. And each time that I come back to it, I find that I'm able to put in a little bit more of that work and find a bit more stability in the practice. So at this current point in my life, I will admit that I'm quite shaky in my Dhamma practice, but coming here and being able to visit a Bayagiri and um, I have plans of going back to my home monastery in New Hampshire when I return back to the East Coast. I really am hoping that this, uh, this time around I can kind of find a way to permanently implement the practice into my life and take it as seriously as I think it needs to be taken. So, thank you. I'm so glad we're here. I'm so glad you guys have brought the practice here. Thai forest is so, it's so beautiful a practice and I love it. So it's my home practice. I think all I wanted to say was that uh, um, I think I struggled a long time with suffering and difficulty and always tried, like so many people said, tried to come up with some way that I would have a solution to the problem. That's what it seems like. Even when I came into the Dhamma, it was to solve a problem. And if I could find a solution, then um, I kind of thought that would be it. And um, it took a while to realize that Dhamma is a long game kind of practice. It's not a solution to a problem, especially since the more you practice, the more you realize what you thought was a problem isn't really a problem. <laughs> so it's this kind of long game change in perspective, long game understanding. And I remember, you know, for years uh, in this practice of trying to get rid of my anxiety, and one day I just had this thought that said, well, what if the anxiety never went away? I mean, that's a thought, but if it didn't go away, would I give up? Maybe I should just give up the practice since that was the only thing that seemed to be constantly generating it. And the, and the thought to me of no longer practicing just to get away from anxiety, shifted something. And I thought that uh, I could not leave the Dhamma. So I was just gonna practice with anxiety and I was gonna be a pro 
an anxiety practice. <laughs> I was going to be the best practitioner with anxiety, which is kind of a strange way to look at the Dhamma. But if you do practice in that way, that instead of the very thing that you think is the problem, if you do practice with it, as Ajahn Chah would say, whatever you think is in the way is the way, if you actually practice with that understanding that, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be practicing with, then all of a sudden the practice and what's possible opens up. That's what I heard from everyone, that instead of trying to fix things and get away from things, everyone seemed to uh, learn to live with and be with whatever came up. So, I'm just grateful to be back here in this place. It's just uh, many years of practicing in this hall here. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like my voice is gonna shake. Um, I'm Amanda and um, I found the Dhamma probably six years ago and was trying everything else before that um, pretty intensively, working intensively, drinking intensively. Um, and I, things were happening in my life that I felt like I should have felt my heart and I didn't. And um, my nephew being born and things that I just felt like I should feel. And um, so I, Googled how to love <laughs> and um, bought the book. And it was Thich Nhat Hanh's book, How to Love. And um, it just all resonated. Um, and then I read who it was and saw that it was a Buddhist monk. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, and so then I started reading about Buddhism and I was like, oh wow, it's, it was resonating. Um, and started listening to the talks at Seattle Insight and um, also found a Buddhist counselor. And um, one of the talks to where he said, if anybody's practicing in the closet, um, please come in. <laughs> and um, it helped me come in. And then I would come in and I would leave <laughs> really fast um, as soon as everything was done. And then they someone else named Danielle there and asked me to stay for tea. And, and um, it was such a, a tremendous support. And, um, and then one day they brought in a, a bukuni um, and within a month, I think I had shaved my head <laughs> and um, just really um, touched something deeply in me and um, and still following, you know, where that that is going and um, really glad to be here in this community. And um, it's, as Xander said, it's becoming his whole life. I've, I feel the same. So, thank you. and uh, told him that they had a question about uh, ordination. And I think like many people, when you become interested in the Dhamma, and especially if it's you know from some monk or some book by a monk or a nun or something, it can be a bit intimidating. It's certainly strange and a bit unusual at first, um, but then people, some people, um, become interested in, and think, you know, it's just not a, uh, a role. It's not an archetype that we have in Western, in, in America, really. I mean, you do have um, Catholic monasteries um, in, in Europe and some in America, but it's, it's not really a thing many of us grow up with. Um, so this person's question was about, uh, yeah, they're, are they a young person, maybe in their 20s? A bit older. A bit older. Okay. Maybe 30s or a bit older something like that. Um, but 
yeah, they're in a, some kind of relationship and, um, but then they're listening to talks by monastics, by yeah, monks and nuns who are celibate and just wondering, feeling this pull towards the Dhamma, this pull towards uh, deeper and deeper practice and uh, hearing the monks and nuns talk about their life and just wondering, in, you know, what, what should I do? Should I stay in this meaningful relationship? Is it even a, a Dhammic relationship? Uh, not sure. But I think this is a really common thing, people trying to figure out the, uh, the role that they play in society and live in society, um, whether to be a, a householder or to be a, a monastic. And now that there are more and more options for that, both for men and women here in America, just wondering about this. And it's a really, it's an extremely personal question. There's no like single right answer. You can't say that the monastic path is, is always right for everybody. You do have some like monastic extremists or um, kind of, what do we call them? Monastic supremacists. supremacists. Yeah, monk supremacists who <laughs> kind of just always push the monastic agenda saying like, yeah, you should shave your head and you know go that path. Um, but it, it's definitely not the way for everybody. Um, and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, in, in a Thai context, uh, it can be something you experiment with. Um, there are, in Thailand, it's, uh, you can take temporary ordination uh, for three months or, you know, a year, or there's no real limit. So people can experiment. Certainly in the monasteries, um, yeah, there are more lay people who go to monasteries than there are monks um, on the whole. So you can experiment and just uh, dip in and try these different modes and figure out what, what resonates and um, yeah, just do experiments and say, okay, I'll go to the, the monastery and, and test it out. And basically when you go to live at a monastery, if you're keeping the rules, then you're basically living like a monk or a nun. Um, so see how it goes and then uh, see if it, if things seem like they're working, then you can, yeah, come and serve a winter retreat, stay longer at a monastery and is it still working? Um, and you might find just living at a place at a monastery or a practice center that, um, yeah, it really does seem like it's working. It does seem like it's clicking. And um, yeah, you're more and more drawn in that connect that that direction. So uh, yeah, just you can allow that. Um, and just as the more you go, each step you take, uh, just reevaluating. And uh, in a Thai context, there's there's no requirement to take lifetime vows. Um, it's beautiful. I think Tanisbo and I both hope that we can put in all the conditions to stay monks for the rest of our lives, but that's certainly, that's not the norm. It's the norm for people to uh, ordain and then not stay monks or nuns for their whole life. So um, yeah, it's, it's an option now. And um, hopefully, yeah, there are monks and nuns you can ask questions to and just uh, experiment yourself and with, with your partner as well. If you're in a relationship, it's, it's really useful to uh, keep things open and figure out what makes sense for both of you um, because uh, yeah, some of these are relationships, especially if it's based on Dhamma, you know, really uh, can be lifelong Kalyanamitta relationships and you don't always wanna just burn the bridge. So do you have any? I thought that was quite good. Just, uh, I do know one young man who was so inspired that he uh, he read about monks and then dressed in white and got this big golden bowl and told his mom that she would have to put food in his bowl and bring it to him from then then on. <laughs> I think it lasted for like a day. So we have <laughs> we have a uh, room for another question.
So for those in the live stream, <clears throat> the question was um, in regards to after hearing Amanda speak um, and just thinking about women uh, and where they might try out an ordination form of some kind at least and what options are available to them. This is, uh, I mean, this is a really important issue. Um, I think it's probably one of the biggest ones in the landscape uh, right now, for good reason. The centers that are kind of beginning in the US, they are uh, kind of just getting off their feet a bit, but some of them have been around now for a good deal of time and the teachers that are leading them are, um, have been practicing for, for decades. Often when I meet a bhikkhuni, I'll kind of add 10 years onto her Voss account because so often they've been, you know, practicing for years, sort of trying to find the right situation, which is harder to find. Um, in the US, you have Dhamma Darini, then in California, led by Aya Tataloka, who's an amazing uh, scholar, nun, bhikkhuni, and was uh, intimately involved in the sort of uh, recent uh, restarting of the bhikkhuni order in Theravada in India. Um, there's Aloka Vihara, which is headed by Aya Nanda Bodhi and Aya Santusika, uh, along with some others. Oh, Santachitta, sorry, Santachitta. Um, the Pali gets us monks too sometimes. And um, they, uh, they ordained as Siladaras initially in England and then moved to the US and have since ordained as bhikkhunis and run a, a beautiful community down there. Um, there's Karuna Buddhist Vihara with Aya Santusika and Aya Chittananda uh, there in California as well. And they'll be visiting us next week. So if people want to speak with them, it's a great chance. In those are the three main training centers I know in the US for bhikkhunis. Um, you also have uh, Sati Saraniya in Canada, which is led by Aya Medanandi, but um, you know that's less of a large community, but she's an amazing teacher. Uh, and then you have Empty Cloud on the East Coast with Aya Soma, who will be visiting us at the end of the month. In England, you have a different form called the Siladara form, which was uh, pioneered by Longpur Sumedho and Ajahn Suchitto, uh, which basically condenses many of the bhikkhuni forms to about, um, I mean, there's 10 official ones, but then 100, 150 kind of um, uh, rules they also hold. And, you know, they, for example, don't touch money as well um, and hold these other forms. That's at Amravati. They sort of exist in a self-governing community, a little off from the monks. Um, and I, Ajahn, they go by Ajahn, not Aya. So Ajahn Sundara and Aya Chandasiri are useful, are amazing practitioners. And if you're interested in sort of seeing the leaders of that form, those are the two. In Australia, especially in Perth, Ajahn Brahm, uh, has created several communities of bhikkhunis uh, there, although the visa situation is a bit more difficult to navigate, but it's possible. And then uh, we just spoke with Aya Panyavati yesterday, um, and she's been intimately involved in starting up uh, a bhikkhuni monastery in Thailand. I think now they have 400 bhikkhunis throughout Thailand. Um, so there is something there, although I think it's a bit more off the radar and finally, Ajahn Jayasaro uh, has been kind of um, working to elevate the Mechi form with a small community of Mechis that live near him and they don't touch money and they go for alms every day as well. 